Indiana Jones is back, and this time he's searching for his father and the Holy Grail in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Released in 1989, the third indie movie sees Dr. Jones, played once again by Harrison Ford, get approached by a businessman called Walter Donovan to go on a quest to find the Holy Grail. Indy learns that his father was also searching for the Grail and has since gone missing. Indy must face an explosive adventure full of many twists and turns and deceits, where he and his father, Henry Jones Sr., played brilliantly by Sean Connery, are reunited and must put aside their estranged differences and work together to retrieve the Holy Grail before the Nazis do, where Indy must take a leap of faith. In this heartfelt and dramatic entry, of which many claim is to be one of the best, if not the best, in the series. So seeing how I have the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade Japanese VHS release, I thought today we'll look into 10 things that you didn't know about Indiana Jones' third adventure, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So, let's choose wisely as we check it out. There's 10 things you didn't know belongs in a museum! Yeah, look, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist it. Let's check it out. Don't call me Junior. Number 10. Steven Spielberg left several potential projects to direct a third indie movie. It is said that when Steven Spielberg and his good friend George Lucas joined forces to work on what may be the greatest adventure movie of all time, Raiders of the Lost Ark, that the original plan was to make three Indiana Jones adventures. Of course, Raiders was a massive success, so a sequel was inevitable, where in 1984, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom was released. However, its release was marred with criticisms, with many feeling that the movie was just too dark, violent, gruesome, and just generally mean-spirited. As Spielberg has since said that he was disappointed with Temple of Doom and wasn't really pleased with the final product. And so henceforth, he wasn't exactly rushing back to the cameras with enthusiasm to direct the third indie adventure. That probably explains why there was a whopping five-year gap in between Temple of Doom and The Last Crusade. However, he did eventually return to the swashbuckling world of Dr. Jones for, if anything, to fulfill his promise to his friend George Lucas. And in returning to direct the third Indiana Jones movie, Spielberg had to leave two other projects that he was in talks of directing those being the comedy movie Big and Rain Man. Spielberg also wanted The Last Crusade to feel like a true successor to Raiders of the Lost Ark, unlike Temple of Doom, which was its own thing and feels more like a surreal horror movie. He wanted to recapture the glory of Indy's first adventure, and thus make it a true sequel to Raiders. That's why in The Last Crusade there is lots of winks and nudges to Raiders of the Lost Ark, as well as characters and settings returning from that movie. Many fans actually really like this stronger link to Raiders, even if it does play it a little safe. I mean, say what you want to say about Temple of Doom, one thing it doesn't do is play it safe. Number 9. Indiana Jones vs The Haunted Castle in Scotland so the big question is, what exciting adventure could Indiana Jones go on for his third theatrical outing? Well, Indiana Jones' creator and producer George Lucas had his own ideas for the third entry, as he wanted to see Indiana Jones take on a haunted castle in Scotland. In fact, supposedly Lucas wanted to use a haunted castle for the setting for the second Indiana Jones movie, before the idea was dropped. However, this time he wanted to get the ball rolling and to see Indy come face to face with ghoulish terrors from beyond the grave. And even got Diane Thomas, who previously wrote the adventure comedy Romancing the Stone, to write a script. So if it was left up to Lucas, this haunted Scottish castle would have been the way of Indiana Jones 3. 
Except for one problem, that was of course Steven Spielberg himself, who had no interest in making an indie movie in a haunted, ghostly setting, as he found it too similar to the movie Poltergeist, which he wrote, produced, and possibly co-directed several years earlier. So feeling that he had already made the definitive ghost movie, he didn't want to tread on grounds that he had already previously stepped on and explored. So it was back to square one to create another adventure for Indiana Jones. Number 8. Indiana Jones and the Monkey King so the next potential third indie movie was called Indiana Jones and the Monkey King, with Gremlins and Goonies writer Chris Columbus penning a script, which like the previous script featured a haunted castle in Scotland, but that subplot was condensed down to just featuring at the start of the movie. Whereas the adventure unfolds, Indy is on a race against evil Nazis to find a mystical garden that has magical peaches, known as the Garden of Immortal Peaches. The quest also leads to the lost city of the Monkey King. The story also featured a pirate, a Nazi with a mechanical arm, a student of Indy's archaeological classes who is obsessed with Indy and stows away on the adventure. The script also saw Indy die in the climax, but would be brought back to life thanks to one of the peaches of immortality. Incidentally, the peaches of immortality and the Monkey King are based on real mythologies. Despite the fact that locations were being sought after in Africa, this Monkey King approach would eventually get scrapped by Spielberg and Lucas for reasons of cultural insensitivity and for it feeling generally unrealistic. Spielberg just felt that he was way too old at that stage to direct such a film. Incidentally, this Monkey King script would get leaked during the 90s, where many fans got really excited thinking that they found a script for an upcoming Indiana Jones 4. But thankfully, there was no Indiana Jones 4 or 5. <laughs> Number 7. Spielberg wanted Indy 3 to be more of a father and son drama. So George Lucas then got the idea of Indiana Jones searching for the Holy Grail. And from there, Spielberg also got the idea of having the main focus on Indy reuniting with his estranged father, Henry Jones Sr., and explore their turbulent relationship, which would result in father and son developing a mutual respect and appreciation of each other. Spielberg wanted to explore the concept of where did Indy come from, and who is responsible for him being the way that he is. Now, Lucas was hesitant, as he wanted the Holy Grail itself to be the main focus of the story, but Spielberg thought that Indy's search for his father would kind of be symbolic of the search of the Holy Grail itself, and thus the stories can be parallels of each other. You see, in between making Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and The Last Crusade, Spielberg's career had something of a shift, where he moved from making fantastical movies like Jaws, E.T. and Close Encounters, and started to focus on human dramas. Movies that were character pieces like The Color Purple and Empire of the Sun. And the father and son drama in The Last Crusade is an extension of this more mature nature of character drama that Spielberg was now turning to, in which of his career, which would still have loud, fun spectacles, do still also have the dramatic character studies. And I do think it's the relationship between Indy and his father that gives The Last Crusade its heart. Number 6. Rewrites, rewrites, and more rewrites. So although the basic gist of The Last Crusade was now formed, that being Indiana Jones searching for his father who was on a quest to find the Holy Grail, there were still many lost ideas and subplots that would be presented and tossed aside. Some of these include Indy falling in love and marrying a nun called Chantel, Henry Jones finding a stairway to heaven, some villain who has gorillas for pets, and a demon that Indy must defeat by stabbing with an ancient dagger, which I swear is the same story as the Golden Child, as well as Indy traveling on the Orient Express. In some other versions, it's Elsa, not Donovan, who shoots Henry Jones, and then dies from drinking out of the wrong cup. Yeah, and Donovan, who is the main villain, was originally called Chandler. 
There are tons of ideas that were suggested but not used, with scripts being written up by Mino Mez, who had previously done script work for Spielberg's previous movies The Color Purple and Empire of the Sun, and Inner Space and Lost Boys writer Jeffrey Boehm. Boehm's script had started to form The Last Crusade much to how it would be seen in the final film, and he is credited as the main scriptwriter. He also believed in the idea of The Last Crusade being more of a personal story, which mainly focuses on the relationship between Indy and his father. As he put it, the movie is an archaeological search for Indy's own identity. Later script rewrites were done by Brazil and Empire of the Sun scriptwriter Tom Stoppard, who was incidentally credited as Barry Watson for some reason. And so The Last Crusade as we know it had finally taken form. Which I think is lucky as usually when a movie has so many scripts and failed ideas, the final product is often a disaster. But The Last Crusade might just have the most polished script in the entire series. Number 5. Casting so Harrison Ford was yet again returning as Indiana Jones, which was a given. I feel like this time we see a more vulnerable side to Indy, as we see him get betrayed by Elsa, who is believed to be the main love interest of the movie, only for her to be revealed as the villain. As well as Indy having to come to terms with the difficulties of reconnecting with his estranged father. The most important piece of casting in the movie was that of Henry Jones. Spielberg always wanted to cast Connery, as he was a fan of the 1960s James Bond movies, and James Bond was a big inspiration for Indiana Jones. So Connery kind of already was Indiana Jones' father. Now, Connery originally turned down the role, as he didn't think it was right as there was only 12 years age gap between him and Harrison Ford. So other veteran actors were considered, including Gregory Peck. And I can remember hearing from somewhere years ago that even third Doctor Who actor, John Pertwee was being considered at some stage. But I don't know if that's true. Eventually, Connery did accept the role, and his chemistry with Ford is totally what makes the film special and gives it its heart, and stops it from being just a Raiders of the Lost Ark clone. The character of Henry was originally written as wise and insightful, very Yoda-like, but Connery reconstructed the character to what we got by adding lots of comedy, where he wasn't this old man of action, but was instead actually quite clumsy and makes bumbling mistakes, and often does get Indy in trouble. In fact, I always thought that Connery's last performance as James Bond in the unofficial Bond film Never Say Never Again is kind of like an early prototype of Henry Jones, of which in that film he would often make this interpretation of James Bond older and more bumbling and prone to mistakes. When it came to the character Elsa, who starts off as Indy's sidekick and love interest but becomes his femme fatale, the character was originally written as having dark hair, and the part was originally offered to British actress Amanda Redman, but she turned it down. So instead the role was given to Alison Doody, and she also has her own connections to James Bond, having previously starred as the villainess Jenny Flex in A View to a Kill as well as starring alongside future Bond Pierce Brosnan in the Irish action movie Taffin. I think that it was an interesting and brave move to not go with the usual approach of having a female character just be the love interest and end the movie with this character falling into Indy's arms like we had seen in the previous two movies. It's definitely a different direction having the female lead as the baddie, and it shows that this is an indie movie that subverts expectations. Young Indy at the start of the movie was played by River Phoenix, who honestly does a brilliant job, and gets Ford's mannerisms down to a T. He was cast as Young Indy at the request of Harrison Ford, as Phoenix had previously played Ford's fictional son in the movie Mosquito Coast. Julian Glover played the movie's big bad Walter Donovan, as he had previously played General Veers in fellow George Lucas production The Empire Strikes Back. And yes, Glover has the honour of being an Indiana Jones villain, a Star Wars villain, a James Bond villain, and a Doctor Who villain, as well as appearing in Game of Thrones. Denham Elliott and John Rhys Davis return as Marcus Brody and Sulla, who were both in Raiders of the Lost Ark, but absent in Temple of Doom, and both now have much larger roles, especially Elliott and Laurence Olivier was originally considered to play the Ancient Knight, but that role ended up going to British actor Robert Edison, who accepted the role and chose wisely. Seriously, anyone else noted that that knight has really become a big meme? 
Number 4. Connery and Ford went pantless while filming one scene. Most of the set filming for The Last Crusade was filmed in England, namely Elstree Studios, just like the first two movies. The Zeppelin scene was filmed at the historical Lawrence Hall in London. The set that had been constructed was so hot that while filming the scenes where Henry and Indy were talking at the table, Connery removed his pants as a way of dealing with the heat. That's trousers for the UK viewers. In fact, the heat was so unbearable on the set, Ford did the exact same thing. And I've also heard from some places that even Spielberg went pantless while filming that scene, but I'm not too sure if that one actually happened. Basically, it was popular to not wear pants while filming that Zeppelin scene. Other filming locations include Venice, Almeria, Spain, as well as the ancient city of Petra in Jordan, which I've always found to be a truly stunning location. The start of the movie was mainly filmed in Alamosa, Colorado, and Utah's Arches National Park. And the end scene where we see the characters ride into the sunset was filmed in Texas. So, really? The Last Crusade was kind of filmed all over the place. Number 3. Deleted Scenes Now ever since the release of the Indiana Jones DVD box set in 2004, we've all been aware of the deleted scene in The Last Crusade where Indy fights a Gestapo agent played by Pat Roach, who also appeared in the previous two Indy movies as different characters. But there are so many more deleted scenes that made it onto the cutting room floor. For example, at the start of the movie where Indy is taken to Donovan by his goons. Originally, his henchmen were more rough and forceful with Indy. There was also a removed shot of one of Donovan's goons pulling out a gun on Indy when they confront him, which definitely makes the scenario more hostile. But all in all, it was right to cut this scene, as it suggests quite early on that Donovan is a big bad guy, and it takes away his eventual big reveal as being the villain. There's a scene showing Indy and Marcus' flight to Venice, where Indy is trying to learn more of his father's diary. A scene where Sulla slaps a camel in the face, which causes the camel to spit all over a Nazi. And there was a longer scene of Indy disposing of the unconscious butler that he punched out. The Gestapo character, who was previously just mentioned, also tries to follow Indy on another airplane, when Indy and his father escape the Zeppelin on their own airplane. Only he and the soldier that he enters the plane with detach the plane before starting the engine, which causes them to fall to their deaths. Seriously, what a bunch of dumb asses. There was another scene where we actually see Indy and Henry meet Salah at a train station, which I always felt was kind of needed, as in the final film he just sort of shows up. A scene where our heroes witness Nazis blowing up a canyon, which leads them to know where to go to conclude their adventure. And during the end sequence, when Indy is walking on the footpath with letters on it, and has to walk on the letters that spell Jehovah, originally, instead of falling through the floor of the wrong letters that he steps on, tarantulas were going to burst out of the letters. As we can see here, where Indy is getting attacked by a tarantula. Which... To me, isn't really threatening, as we've already seen Indy brush away tarantulas with ease at the start of Raiders of the Lost Ark. A lot of these deleted scenes would actually go on to feature in the Last Crusade comic book adaptations by Marvel. It'll be interesting to see if any of these deleted scenes ever get released. If anything, to give us an insight into what the Last Crusade could have been like. Number 2. One scene was added to boost up the action. It was during the movie's post-production that Spielberg and editor Michael Kahn saw an early cut of The Last Crusade, and they just felt like there wasn't enough action in it. Yes, this is more of a drama indie adventure, but it was also felt that one more big spectacle was needed, which led to the filming of the motorbike chase, which incidentally was filmed near George Lucas's Skywalker Ranch. And it's a very well shot scene, and does add that extra razzle dazzle to the film. And while we're talking about post-production, we must also mention John Williams' amazing score. Okay, the new pieces of music doesn't necessarily sound big or as adventurous as his previous indie scores, but they do sound more heartfelt and even biblical, suggesting that not only is Indy searching for the Holy Grail, but is also going on his own personal journey. The music really does have plenty of heart and warmth, and it is definitely up there as being one of his best scores. 
Also during the post-production phase, a really humorous trailer was put together, which shows the difficulties that Harrison Ford has to go through of trying to keep his Indiana Jones hat on, which results him to stapling it to his head. Of which this comical slapstick approach is interesting to go with with promoting an Indiana Jones movie. And okay, this is just a pet peeve of mine, but has anyone else noticed in The Last Crusade, Indy spends most of the action wearing this tie with his costume? This is something that has always driven me nuts. Yeah, it's a small and insignificant thing, but to me it just stands out like a sore thumb. I know it was part of Indy's disguise when he enters the castle, but I don't know, I just wish they got rid of it earlier. It's almost like Harrison Ford accidentally left it on. I don't know, who knows. Number 1. Beating Expectations The third Indiana Jones movie was released in May 1989 and it broke records on its opening weekend. But that would get surpassed later in the year with the release of Ghostbusters 2 and Tim Burton's Batman. All up, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade made over $474 million, with it making not only more money than Temple of Doom but also Raiders of the Lost Ark. Last Crusade was seen as a welcome return to form by critics and fans alike, and it's often been seen as being just as good as the first Indiana Jones movie. So after the disappointing reception of Temple of Doom, Last Crusade did put Indiana Jones back on the map. It also won an Academy Award for Best Sound Effects, and Sean Connery's performance was so wisely praised, he was nominated for a Golden Globe for his performance as Henry Jones Sr., with many believing that it was his performance that made this indie adventure that bit more special and heartfelt. However, over the years though, there have been claims that The Last Crusade feels a bit stale, and is a little too safe, especially when compared to the previous two entries. And because of that, this Indiana Jones movie lacks punch and excitement. And I'll admit it, when I was a kid, I wasn't really into The Last Crusade. I remember seeing it as a double feature on TV with The Temple of Doom when I was a kid. And I loved The Temple of Doom and was fully invested. But by the time The Last Crusade came on, I kept zoning out and my interest just wasn't as captivated. It just felt like after the pace of Temple of Doom, things just really started to slow down with Last Crusade. And when I brought the Indiana Jones VHS box set, I watched the heck out of Raiders and Temple. Whereas Crusade was one that I just saw every once in a while. But that said, Last Crusade is one that I've actually really come to love with age. Like, I mean, I love this film now. As I've gotten older, I've really come to appreciate its themes and its stories of difficult relationships between fathers and sons. Something that went over my head as a kid, but also something that I'm really on board with now. This is definitely an Indiana Jones movie that gets better the older you get. And that's the heart of this movie. Yes, on the outside, it's an Indiana Jones movie, but on the inside, it's a movie about parents and their children and acceptance. The journey between Indy and his father is what makes The Last Crusade a truly memorable movie and surpasses it from being an average movie. And I wouldn't want it any other way. This one is the emotional Indy adventure. So to me, it simply is the third part of a perfect trilogy. And it's just as good and as compelling as the other entries. This is, after all, the original Indiana Jones trilogy and it is perfect the way that it is. So in conclusion, The Last Crusade is a piece of old lost treasure that came back to me as an adult and showed me its true wonders. So that was my look into Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade and I love this entry and it feels like the perfect conclusion to the series. And I can see why many people say that they find it to be their favourite entry in the series or be that their second favourite after Raiders. Anyway, I'm Minty, and I wonder if there is a parallel universe out there somewhere where they have made an Indiana Jones 4 and 5. And if they have done that, then they chose poorly. See ya!